It was about 1850 when in a narrow canyon in the Ochre Mountains to the west of the Salt Lake Valley, two Mormon brothers, Sanford and Thomas Bingham, while grazing cattle for the Mormon president, Brigham Young, stumbled upon precious metals. Young discouraged the finds, saying the mining life would bring only nakedness, starvation, utter destitution, and annihilation to his people. But Colonel Patrick Connor thought otherwise. Arriving in the valley in 1862 and upon hearing rumors of the find, Connor, described as a tough, uncompromising 41-year-old Irishman, sent his soldiers into the canyon. He and 24 others later filed the first mining claim and formed the West Mountain Quartz Mining District. By the end of the 1800s, men and women from all over the world began to arrive, to live and work in this canyon in the middle of the American West, bringing little more than a dream of a better life and the sheer strength of their labor, labor that would build a thriving mining community and fuel one of the largest copper mines in the world. The pick and shovel gave way to high-powered earth-moving machines, and within a span of just over 100 years, the expansion of the mine engulfed their homes, their towns, and eventually the canyon itself. Bingham was no more. This, then, is their story. Copper Canyon, American Dream. The story of the towns and people of Bingham Canyon, Utah. Local production of Copper Canyon, American Dream was made possible in part by the R. Harold Burton Foundation, the George S. and Dolores Dore Eccles Foundation, the C. Comstock Clayton Foundation, and the support of the contributing members of KUED. Fall, the prettiest season of the year is here, and the mountains are alive with brilliant colors. The first touch of frost has turned the mountainsides into a maze of bright yellow and red leaves, intermingled with the dark green of the evergreens. All of this beauty looks down on a scene of desolation as old Bingham continues each day to move closer to its ultimate end. It was 1911, and I was five years old when we got off the train called Bingham Bill. We were headed for our new home at the Bingham and Garfield Yards in the canyon. We walked across Car Fork Bridge, dodging dinky engines, belching smoke, and bouncing over the tracks like a nervous dog on a leash. What a sight for all of us. Here we were perched on the side of a narrow canyon overlooking the town with a clear view of the hill where the steam shovels were tearing away the mountain and loading it into railroad cars. In those days, it was a big hill and not a huge hole in the ground. John Creedon. By the time young John Creedon and his family arrived in 1911, Bingham Canyon was home to over a thousand people living and working in a jumble of hard scrabble towns. Creedon, a stout Irishman, later wrote about the history and life in the canyon in a weekly Bingham Bulletin newspaper column called Down Memory Lane. He had beautiful, wavy black hair, um, always a smile on his face. He loved people, and uh, he wanted people to, to be able to remember what Bingham was like. Bingham's earliest miners were principally placer gold miners, and panning for gold was the most important work in the canyon for many years. The gold found here was not of great quantity, such as some of the early boom discoveries in other parts of the West, and the lure of a major strike was at the end of the rainbow for the prospector. When the first railroad line came to Bingham in 1873, new businessmen came to the canyon. As reported in the Bingham Souvenir Booklet published in 1909, there were 21 producing mines in 1891. But all these miners shared one thing in common. They were basically all underground miners. And the deeper they mined, they found less of what they were looking for, the lead, the silver, and the gold, and came upon more and more copper. But the copper was very, very low grade. However, at that time, near the turn of the century, uh, America was changing pretty dramatically. You literally had the electrification 
and the communication of American society. And so copper was a most important strategic metal. Bingham was on the eve of a copper boom. The first great influx to the canyon began in the 1860s and 70s, with immigrants arriving from Northern Europe. They were decidedly not the saints or Mormon converts that were settling in the Great Salt Lake Valley to the east. They didn't follow a prophet to the land of Zion, but came instead enticed by rumors of gold, silver, and other precious metals. The immigrants uh, considered themselves sojourners. They came here to get enough money to help their uh, impoverished parents, provide sisters with dowries, have a little savings, go back to their countries, set up a few, a shop, or become a money lender, uh, something that would uh, raise them from a laborer into the middle class. In the late 1800s, Andrew Dahlstrom came to the United States by way of Ellis Island. He made his way through the mining towns of Colorado to Utah, where he met his future wife, Annie Backland. Their daughter, Ellen Dahlstrom Stewart. And they used to pin a label on them as to where they were going because these people couldn't speak English, undoubtedly. Scandinavians would come from the old country and they needed somewhere to live. So they went to boarding houses. And my folks had a big boarding house where they accommodated Scandinavians, Swedish, Finnish people. It was three stories. And mother did all the cooking for the boarders. And she would begin her day at 3 o'clock in the morning and was going strong all day, preparing three meals. But not only that, they took lunches with them. There would be two sandwiches, one of meat and one of eggs, and then there was always a piece of pie for dessert. So it called for many pies. So I was a young age when I had to begin helping out by making the pies. So I got to be a pretty good pie maker. The Dahlstroms settled in the Car Fork area of the canyon, also known as Finn or Swede Town. They joined immigrants from Northern Europe, Wales, Ireland, France, Germany, and England. They were the hard rock underground miners. The early canyon was beautiful. Uh, Old timers have told me that everything was green then and how beautiful it was and the little streams were crystalline and the air was, air was so pure. Little by little, people started to move in and immediately the entire canyon lost that beautiful natural uh, beauty that it once had. Bingham Canyon cut a deep groove in the Ochre Mountains in a west, then southern direction. Author and resident Marion Dunn described it thusly. Bingham Canyon was a town attached to a mine. The umbilical cord was Main Street, a long, narrow, twisting thoroughfare. The city limits were four miles from the mouth of the canyon. From there, Main Street snaked its way up canyon three miles, where it forked. The right road led up Car Fork to Highland Boy, the left continued, then covered two miles to Copperfield, which included Dinkyville, Telegraph, Terrace Heights, and two suburbs known in those days simply as Jap Camp and Greek Camp. In the mountains between Highland Boy and Copperfield lay the heart of the copper mine, first the hill, and then by degrees it became the pit. Bingham was called a string town. The canyon was so narrow it was said that a dog in Bingham Canyon could only wag its tail up and down. And if you could drive on Main Street, which was only 20 feet wide, you could drive any place in the world. Well, it looked like uh, just one street town, you know, just the you know, houses were all close together and, and the high walls of the mountain on each side of you and, uh, you know, just one way in, one way out. But it was Daniel C. Jackling, a young metallurgy engineer from Missouri who literally changed the face of mining and life in Bingham Canyon. Jackling would revolutionize copper mining, bringing it to the surface, eventually consolidating most of the mines of the canyon into the giant Utah Copper Company. These copper ores were low grade, one or two percent, highly diffused, but massive in amount. 
And so if you were going to mine that successfully, it would be efficient to do it from the surface using new industrial techniques in copper mining, which was basically the use of steam shovels to dig the material up and locomotives powering, in essence, trains to remove the material from the site. It was in the boarding house of the Bingham and Garfield Railroad that I first met the man who brought fame to Bingham Canyon and a new era in the mining of low-grade ore, Daniel C. Jacklin. He would come to Bingham in his private car with several of his party, and they would have dinner at our house. What a spread Mother would put on for these visitors. On June 4, 1903, Jackling incorporated the Utah Copper Company, the predecessor of today's Kennecott Utah Copper Corporation. A year later, in 1904, Bingham was incorporated as a city with a population of 1,700. The stage was set for Bingham to blossom. With the turn of the 20th century and an invigorated need for labor, a new wave of immigrants began to arrive from southern and eastern Europe. They built in Bingham Canyon an enclave of diversity in even more pronounced contrast to the Mormon settlers in the valley below. First came fathers and brothers, and then the new brides and families followed. From southern Europe came the Italians, Greeks, and the Slavic people. They came from Austria, Yugoslavia, and Serbia. Highland Boy became the center of the Italian, Austrian, and Slav folk, and what a fine group of people they were. With the building of the railroads and the many miles of track at the Utah Copper Company, the need for trackmen was filled largely by the Japanese. Copperfield became the main setting for the Japanese and the Greek settlements. Many of the Italians settled Upper Main Street in Bingham, John Creedon. Young men arriving from the impoverished Greek countrysides made up one of the most substantial populations in the canyon. They grouped together in Copperfield in a Greek camp. They called it Greek camp. There was a jab camp and so forth because there was a commonality that they would bond together. And they'd go to work uh, 10, 12 hours a day. And one of the fellows would stay home and cook and have some things ready for him when he got home. But it was a hardship and uh, it wasn't easy. And some of them started corresponding and picture brides to find a wife. Some of them, uh, like my father, went back to Greece after he had established his confectionery in a candy store, went back to Greece, met mother, married her, came back over. Some of them brought sisters over and married him off to a good friend. And that's how the family got started. And some of the gentlemen married other ladies in the, in the uh, area. My mother would often receive letters from girls in the old country, primarily Finland, who wanted to come to America and they needed their journey money because they didn't have any money, so she would advance the money for them to come. But as it turned out, they'd come and meet some of these young unmarried men who had come from the old country years maybe before, and they would marry. Very, very few of them were able or did pay back their journey money. Bingham in 1911 was a typical Western mining town. Where there was a sidewalk, it was wooden, and the street itself was dirt, dust, mud, or snow, whatever the season happened to be. The street would be filled with wagons or sleds of all kinds. The first automobiles appeared on the street, to the scoffing of the old timers that the horseless carriage was a passing fancy. In 1910, John Knudsen was hired as the head guard for Utah Copper Company. His reputation for bravery and ability in handling men had come to the attention of J.D. Schilling, Jr., superintendent of the mine. His wife, Emma, and eight children joined him in the canyon in 1916. My grandfather, John Knudsen, was almost six feet tall. He was rather stocky build. Uh, he had grown up and uh, had carried mail when there were Indian troubles in San Pete County. And so he was really very brave, I feel, and uh, each of my uncles were very proud to be working as locomotive engineers. So all the Knutsons worked for the hill. During mining strikes as head of company security, Knutson would find he was neither very popular nor very safe. His skill in handling men would be tested during the big strike of 1912. By 1912, the population of miners in Bingham Canyon is 5,000. 
of which 4,000 are foreign born. The largest group of the foreign born would be Greek immigrants of about 1,200. And the native born occupied the better positions and were paid a higher wage than the immigrants. The Greeks faced an additional problem because many of them had been recruited into the Utah Copper Company or the Boston Consolidated Copper Company through a labor agent system. And the chief labor agent in the district was a fellow named Leonidas Scleris. And uh, he basically had a system of peonage where one had to pay Scleris to get a job, and he was a contractor for the company, although the company would always deny it. And then they would pay a fee thereafter to maintain their job, once again to Scleris. That summer, the Western Federation of Miners had been successful in organizing a union. They demanded that the mining companies recognize the union and increase wages. Bingham was now the largest copper producer in America and Utah Copper the industry leader. If a strike were to be successful, it had to be won against Utah Copper. By literally September of 1912, there was a full-blown strike in the canyon. As a rule of thumb, immigrant miners supported the strike. Native-born American miners many times did not. With almost 5,000 miners out on strike, the companies brought in guards to protect their property and strike breakers to continue mining operations. Over 300 deputy sheriffs from Salt Lake County plus the Utah National Guard were called. The tension was high. There was violence. Uh, the miners uh, occupied uh, the high ground overlooking the mines and were literally encamped in the hillsides uh, with their rifles and their revolvers. Uh, miners also were at all the railroad junctions to try to avoid uh, workers or strike breakers from, from coming in. Under pressure, labor agent Scleris was forced to resign. The Greek miners had won that concession. However, by the end of October 1912, with the mining companies bringing in thousands of strike breakers, the union had to concede failure. A union would not successfully organize in Bingham until the 1940s. The strike resulted in the loss of several lives and left Bingham businesses and townspeople broken. My grandfather was working, my, on my dad's side, was working there at the time. They struck for better wages, but the copper company and the governor at that time, Governor Spry, broke that strike. And as a result of that, and they literally broke the strike, they brought in gun bearers and they brought those people to their knees. Every three years, it seems like we'd have a new strike. Some were short and some were long. If the company's copper was uh, worth a lot, the strike would be short. If it was cheap, we'd have a nine-month strike. I remember as a kid the strikes. There, was, there wasn't a whole lot to eat, and, and my parents did what they could, but they believed in it because they believed that that great big hole in the ground that, that your viewers will see, that was a mountain once. I mean, if you think about it, it wasn't just flat and they dug the hole. It was a mountain. And the people that dug that hole were people like my grandparents and my father and the Osaros and the Sacitas and the Saltuses and the Sorterios and the Garcias and the Valdezes and run the names down. They dug that hole. It was during this strike that the first Mexicans and Mexican-Americans were actively recruited to work in the mines as strike breakers. The strike was widely covered in Utah newspapers, and to the outside world, this added to the belief that Bingham was a lawless, untamed remnant of the Wild West. It was the code of the West that gambling, drinking, and ladies of easy virtue followed the miners wherever they went, and Bingham was no exception. When Prohibition came, it was little noticed in Bingham. We had our red light district too, but it was regulated by the law, and the citizenry saw little of the gilded ladies. Old time stories are told of the chicken ranch and the infamous 520 Main Street brothels of Madams Big Helen and Dorothy. In later years, business licenses were issued to the sporting houses under the label of rooming house or hotel. 
the lady that was in charge of the house, the house of prostitution, she would uh, say it's like the Lions Club was going to have some kind of a drawing or anything. She'd get tickets galore. She'd just buy them, you know. And she, everybody called her Big Helen, but everybody really liked her, you know. Uh, and I used to have to meet with her once in a while when I was mayor. And, but we would not meet there. We would meet in another lady's home. As for gambling, former Bingham Mayor Joe Dispenza tells about being questioned by the grand jury. And he says, uh, do you have gambling in Bingham? And I say, yes, we do. I says, every mining community in the world has gambling. He says, do you have a house of prostitution? I says, yes, we do. And all the customers come from Salt Lake, which was true. They come on in yellow cab. And he says, do you gamble? And I said, I do. I said, do you play golf? And he says, yes. I said, do you play for money? He said, we're asking the questions here. So then he says, you're excused, and he let us go. That's all that was ever done. Contrary to the town's reputation as a rough and lawless mining camp, crime was never a real problem in Bingham, according to historian Marion Dunn. If an inmate was in jail, he most likely was there for public intoxication. And the residents say they never locked their doors. They felt safe. Bingham's one bank robbery in 1914 was thwarted and the assailant was caught hiding in an outhouse. Bingham did have crime, however. The most notorious resulted in a manhunt for a murderer. The blackest crime in the long history of Bingham Canyon occurred on November 21st, 1913. Resident Joseph Porath wrote about the incident. A Mexican miner named Lopez had killed a man in a saloon brawl. He had then supplied himself with rifle and ammunition and fled south over the mountains. Deputies who followed him found him the next day in the vicinity of Lehigh. Here he shot and killed three deputies from ambush. He then returned to Highland Boy to get more clothing and provisions. It was then rumored that he was hiding in the Apex Mine. All the tunnels of the Apex were closed with bulkheads and sulfur was burned to penetrate the mine with poisonous smoke. Joseph Porath. But there was no sign of Lopez. More poison was discharged into the mine and two more deputies were gunned down. But when the smoke cleared, Rafael Lopez was nowhere to be found. He was never apprehended. By 1914, Bingham was the most cosmopolitan mining district in the United States. 65% of its population was foreign born, with Greeks being the predominant nationality. Each nationality had its own stores, restaurants, coffee houses, bathhouses, saloons, and pool halls. 28 miles from Salt Lake City, they relied upon and fostered a special relationship with the doctors that served their communities. These medical professionals had their hands full. In the early days, it was a familiar sight to see Dr. Flynn, or Strop, with her little black bag tied to the saddle, making their way to a sick call. It was in the old Bingham livery that the hearse with glass windows was stored. I could never figure out the reason for the glass windows. You couldn't see anything but the coffin, and for sure the occupant could not see out the window. John Creedon. In 1918, Dr. Russell G. Frazier came to Bingham to begin a 40-year tenure as resident physician for Utah Copper Company. He wrote his reminiscences for the Utah Historical Quarterly. I started to work for Dr. D. H. Ray, my conveyance was a big black horse, my salary $100 per month, room, board, and experience. My competitors were Dr. J.F. Flynn and Dr. F.E. Strop, the mayor of the town. These old doctors were great guys, well qualified in their work, and very friendly to the young doctor who knew it all. The adventurous Dr. Frazier was an avid river runner and as a member of the Elite Explorers Club of New York City was selected physician surgeon to Admiral Richard Byrd on his expedition to the South Pole in 1939. He made the citizens of Bingham Canyon proud. The business district of Bingham City proper was described by Marion Dunn as a town of small businesses run by men and women who dealt with their customers on a personal basis. The merchants of Bingham Canyon have carried us through good times and bad times, booms and depressions, strikes and layoffs and cutbacks. They have suffered the loss of income along with the workers and had the same problems with making ends meet. We have had some great characters too. Joe Berger, I think, tops the list. Joe came to Bingham as a mortician and has run the gauntlet, cigar store, pool hall operator, and souvenir salesman. 
Joe tells of the big shooting in Bingham, the Lopez manhunt. When an outlaw by the name of Lopez killed several men, Joe was to bury one of the victims. There was no money. So Joe dressed the victim in a black suit, stood him up in the back of his funeral parlor, and charged admission to see him. Joe said he had enough left over for flowers. Mr. Charlie Adderley, the manager of the Bingham Mercantile Company, was one of our grand persons whom I remember most kindly. Many were the bills of groceries Mr. Adderley handed out the back door of his store, knowing well that he would not get paid. During the Depression years, there were very few people in Bingham that did not owe him a grocery and clothing bill. How he managed to carry all of them, I will never know. He told me one day that most of the people had repaid him. Dr. Russell G. Fraser. Charles Adderley founded the Bingham Mercantile Company store in 1896. Centrally located on the corner of Car Fork and Main Street, it was so large it seemed to cover a city block. With a vast array of merchandise and wide front and side porches, it became the hub of the canyon. 18-year-old Rexford Rex Tripp was hired at the Merc in 1913. The Bingham Mercantile Company sent for me to come down and go to work for them. Bingham was really booming, and it was very difficult to find a place to live there. Shortly after I moved to Bingham, war clouds began to build up over Europe. On the 6th of April, 1917, the United States declared war against Germany. After being inducted into the Army and eventually sent overseas, we embarked on the 4th of July, 1918, Rick's trip. Six Binghamites lost their lives serving the United States in World War I. There is no record of how many Serbs, Italians, or Greeks from the canyon died while serving their countries of origin. If you continued to follow Main Street past Bingham City proper for another two and a half miles, you'd reach Upper Bingham, eventually named Copperfield by the old timers. Nestled near the top of the canyon at an altitude of 6,500 feet above sea level, this bustling little community was ringed by the even loftier encampments of Dinkyville, Telegraph, Terrace Heights, Japanese Camp, or Jap Camp as it was then called, and Greek Camp, clinging to the sides of the surrounding mountains. John Knutson's youngest daughter, Mabel, described her introduction to Copperfield. The tow-headed Swedes and Danes of my former home were replaced by swarthy Italians, Greeks, and other nationalities representing a score of countries. I soon discovered them to be delightful, friendly neighbors. One of my first new friends was Charlie the Greek, who had a dairy. His two horses pulled a small wagon which contained milk jugs and little pitchers with long spouts. Directly east of us stood a coffee house where crowds of Greek bachelors spent their lonesome hours talking, gambling, dancing and singing Greek songs and smoking pipes with long stems which were connected to a pot on the floor. Across the street was a three-story building which housed a grocery store, the Panhellenic, on the bottom floor and a large dance floor on the second. The top floor was the home of the red light girls. For the first few weeks we lived there, Mother had her hands over my eyes. But I wanted to be outside watching constantly, and Mother had so many other things to do that she finally gave up. Mabel Knudsen. When we moved into Copperfield, we lived in a little tiny wooden home in back of the Miner's Merc. And there were stairs up the back of the Merc and a raised sidewalk in front of our home that went on uh, so that the people from the houses higher up on the mountain could walk past. And I remember watching all these people who were very different from any I'd ever known. I remember the noise, the, the machines that I think put air into the mines and uh, this kind of thing. I heard this constant thud. And at first I thought, oh, giants, <laughs> and was a little bit frightened. But I got so, I expected the noise and enjoyed it. The copper pit was getting deeper. The shovels were gouging more foliage from the mountains to create more and bigger levels. And more people were pouring into the area and needing housing. Above the Copperfield School, they created an area called Terrace Heights, where houses were built level behind level until they reached Dinkyville, high on the mountainside. Dinkyville was named after the small steam engines that were used to haul the overburden or waste away from the blasting sites. 
My dad was a miner. And in those days, they used to move the track a little farther in. And then they'd take part of the mountain, part of the hill away. And then the next day, they'd have to move the track again. And it was all hard work, you know. It was done, all, done by hand, pick and shovel. I remember that they used to bring home powder boxes. And they were used to transport the pottery. In those days, they were made out of wood. And you know, everybody used the powder boxes for everything. And the ones that they broke up on the hill, you know, dynamite they would um, bring them for kindling. Sydney Elizabeth Holmes was a miner's daughter born in 1904 to Swedish Finn immigrants in the town of Frisco, Utah. When she was in her teens, she arrived in Bingham Canyon looking for work. I went up to work at the Copper Hotel in Copperfield as a waitress and quit there. I went to the U.S. Hotel and it was the best place I ever worked. We made $50 clear there and room and board. Them days Bingham was very crowded. Sydney met and then married Harvey Halverson. Their first home was in the tiny enclave of Telegraph high on the mountainside overlooking Copperfield. We lived in this little house, it wasn't, didn't look much, but. We lived in pines and quaking asp, and maple, choke cherries. And there was grass in the mountains. It was uh, the place where I, I called the Big Grove. It was where the Mormons cut all the trees off to, to build Salt Lake. And these trees were at least six feet in diameter. Nobody ever believed me how big they were, but I still remember playing on them. We had no water in the house, so there was no bathroom or kitchen sink. We had three small rooms, a light with a pull chain hanging in the center of each room, no plug-in sockets, outlets, no refrigerator. Coal stuff was kept in a mine entrance in the kitchen. I remember Telegraph, was, and, and U.S. was probably the last two real company towns up there. And if your father lost his job, you lost the house immediately. It wasn't no if, ands, or but. They all you out. It was kind of hard. Mike Gonzalez's parents, Guadalupe and Tomas, came from Mexico in the early 1920s. Linda, Mike's wife, was raised in Bingham, Mike in Terrace Heights. Well, that's, that's where I remember living in Terrace Heights. And, uh, there was, like I say, 14 of us, and we all had, uh, we bunked together, and we didn't uh, have a, a bed for each one of us. And uh, we, uh, another thing, too, is that, you know how everybody wants a, a bathroom of their own? <laughs> we had one bathroom. <laughs> the ground up there looked pretty steep, and it was. And we used to always joke about it, that one of our legs was shorter than the other. As the mining operations tore away the earth, the hill became the pit. With the road from Bingham proper to Copperfield running perilously close to mining operations, making travel increasingly more hazardous. The solution? A 1.4 mile long underground tunnel curving from the intersection of Car Fork and Main all the way to Copperfield. Lights controlled the one-way traffic. The tunnel was completed in 1939. In the early days of Utah Copper, Daniel Jackling had a practice of bringing up young, promising men through the ranks of the company. In 1914, Lewis Buckman joined the company as an assistant assayer. By 1952, he had risen to the position of vice president and director of its successor, Kennecott Utah Copper Corporation. Buckman was born in Latvia in 1886 and emigrated to the U.S. in 1893. He was one of Bingham's most beloved citizens. Daniel Jacklin was a legend in our house, and uh, Mr. Jacklin uh, referred to Lou and called him the greatest miner that ever lived. He could move more rock faster and cheaper than any man he knew. Well, I always thought in the 1950s when I knew him best that he looked like Nikita Khrushchev, but he was a short, stocky man, probably 5'7", barrel-chested, thinning white hair, by this time, uh, gruff on the exterior, 
sentimental on the interior, very efficient, very precise, except for his attire sometimes. I always remember a big, a big sloppy cigar and a soup stain on his tie. Lou, as he was affectionately called by everyone, was one of Bingham's greats. He started to work in Bingham as an underground mucker at $2.50 per day and worked his way to the top. During the Depression, Lou was concerned how his people were getting the medicine they needed. He told me to put a number on their prescriptions and arranged with the drugstore that they be charged to him personally, unknown to the patient until this day. Dr. Russell G. Frazier. Well, he sounded very gruff, but he was as gentle as a bear and the kindest man that you would ever know. He took an interest in his employees. He was not only interested in how much work they did, but in how their families were managing. He would walk in that mine and talk to people and visit with them, you know, and which made the guys feel a lot better. Lewis Buckman knew just how dangerous mining could be. In the early days, it was exceptionally treacherous. A husband or son may never return home at the end of the workday, the victim of a mine accident. Miners could be trapped by water or fire, maimed or killed by explosions, poisonous gas, machinery, or runaway trains. 19-year-old Joshua Albert Thurber was seriously injured while trying to squeeze by a mule train four ore cars pulled by a mule in a narrow tunnel in the Highland Boy Mine on December 21st of 1905. I crowded the side of the tunnel as much as possible to escape injury, but it was no use. There was not room for me there with the cars moving, and the second car caught me, turning me a little. The third rolled me around, crushing my hips and breaking my right arm, and the fourth and last car knocked me down. Joshua Albert Thurber. Like so many men in those early days, Ellen Dahlstrom Stewart's father, Andrew, died a victim of miners' consumption. He was not a miner, but died from the constant dust in the boarding house he cleaned. In those early days, it was dry drilling. And these poor fellows who worked underground breathed that air. And their lungs would fill with dust. Not a germ, not a disease, but with dust. The cemetery there in Bingham Canyon, at the mouth of Bingham, was full of these poor, unmarried men. When uh, they were blasting, a lot of times, or drilling, a lot of times these rocks came down and hit them. I'd seen my dad come home many a times with, uh, with a broken, broken uh, hard hat and stuff like that, bleeding and stuff like that. And, and then they'd get powder headaches and gee, that, I had a powder headache sometimes just from the smelling the clothes that they wore and the powder and stuff like that. And it, it, it's quite a headache. In October of 1922, Dr. Paul S. Richards agreed to come to the Bingham Hospital to assist with the burgeoning practice of an ailing Dr. Strop. I spent the first afternoon in the office and was impressed with the many nationalities that came in. I had never seen such a variety, even in the cosmopolitan center of Boston in the outpatient department. Many of the men were antagonistic and even challenged me. Before the day was over, I had had three free-for-all brawls and had knocked three men down. By the time the third man came along, I was getting in pretty good form. That evening, after I was through at the hospital, I strolled uptown with one of the men from the mine, Boyd Bernard, and went through the various joints and heard several men pass remarks. One said, there goes the new doc. He's a pretty tough SOB. Better be careful what you say to him or he'll tie into you. That day was the only time I ever had a fight in Bingham. They considered me a rather tough hombre and a regular fellow from then on, and I got along very well. He had a booming voice and, and a laugh that would, that would fill whatever building or house he was in when, when he set it off, when he let it go, and which was often... and. Uh, uh, frequent. Um, he looked, had a kind of an eagle-eyed look. Uh, when he looked at you, you, you knew he was looking right through you. You knew he meant business. Uh, he had a sincerity about him that uh, was just, uh, that was just incredible. My first night in Bingham was a very restless one as I heard the blasting in the mines, and especially in the Utah Copper Pit, going on all night long. 
It seemed to me that this must be characteristic of the battlefront, where the shooting goes on in a periodic, rhythmic fashion. As the Little Bingham Hospital expanded under his care, Dr. Richards became a pioneer in establishing the fields of industrial medicine and mine safety. He developed innovative techniques for back surgery and was instrumental in the success of community and school health, all by treating the miners and townspeople of the canyon. They didn't have safety and protection equipment. The mines were full of dust, silicosis, and, and cave-ins were common. People died, people died uh, horrible deaths, uh, lingering deaths, and he said, you know, this is not, something's not right here. This isn't right. What can I do to, to make it better? Dr. Richards was an amazing man, very intelligent, very skilled. The people came from all over the world to be treated by him. I worked for him uh, between my junior and senior year in the office. My feeling toward him was one of great respect but fear, because if he was ever displeased, he could be quite terrifying. And on the other hand, if he was pleased and he laughed, his laugh just echoed through the hospital. With all the hours given to his profession, he still had time to be a community leader. I like to remember Dr. Richards as he participated in our first Galena days. He made his calls dressed in high silk hat and cutaway coat and his little black bag. He entered into the life of the community 100% all the way. Dr. Richards lived in the canyon and ran the Bingham Hospital for 26 years. His youngest daughter, Lenore, followed in his footsteps. She was the walking, breathing allegory of excellence. They, they practiced hand in hand for years. They, um, they were quite a team. Sometimes just living near the mine could be dangerous. When I was about eight years old, I, I used to walk from Bingham Canyon up through Copperfield. We'd walk through the center of the, of the pit. And on the way up, there was three or four little shelters that was built on poles that if the, they were gonna blast, You'd hear this blast of the whistle and then you'd run into these shelters. There was lots of people that got hit with small rocks and stuff. I don't know how many got injured that very bad, but it was quite dangerous to walk through. When they blasted, oh, you could hear it all over the valley, it seemed like to me. It filled the area around where we lived with a lot of dust and you could smell that powder. We used to uh... All, all the time say we lived by whistles because there was a whistle in the morning when, when they went to work. There was a whistle at the lunchtime. There was a whistle when, when they were going to blast because everybody had to get out of the way. Evelyn Vietti Hunter was born in Bingham Canyon. When she was just two months old, her family experienced the danger of living in the narrow, steep-sided canyon. I was in my cradle and I had just cried, and my dad picked me up. When they heard this, he heard this rumbling, and he jumped up on a couch, and a six-ton rock came through our house over my brother's bed. The rock crushed my cradle as it knocked, the, the houses were pretty small, knocked the front part of it, and rolled across the street, which was a muddy road, and into the creek. The creek was covered with boards, and uh, it had to be blasted out to be removed. Nowhere in the canyon was it steeper or narrower than within the confines of the Highland Boy area nestled between Sunshine and Clipper Peaks. Resident Vern Abreu wrote, Highland Boy begins where Bingham City ends about halfway up the canyon above Car Fork. Many mines, large and small, cover these mountains. Houses were built all over the hills, on both sides of the road, and on any available flat areas that could be found. Yugoslavians, Italians, Basque, the Englishmen, and the Welsh settled in Highland Boy, bringing their customs, quirks, and in some ways, tried to duplicate the way of life they had left behind. Old habits were hard to break, and the carrying of guns and shooting one another over things such as religious beliefs was a very serious problem. They rode those horses through Carfork, 
And they had guns, and they didn't hesitate using them. They shot into the air just to make a racket and a noise. And because they were traveling that way, my mother would not let her children off this boarding house platform, which is high. John Osoro's parents were Basque, who immigrated to Utah from Spain. Idle Boy was a mining camp, underground. People were very close. Had to be, there was no money. I think everybody that had a more than one language, like we had Spanish and Basque, and then when American come into it, going to the first grade, hey, you had to wake up, you know, you had to learn it. They ask you, you want to eat? And you said, no, and you didn't get nothing to eat. Well, that didn't happen the second time. <laughs> Irma Spanga Yengich's parents came to Highland Boy from Italy. She married Nick Yengich. His parents came to Bingham from Croatia. When the tourists came up to Highland Boy to, you know, to look the town over, uh, they were amazed to see all these homes on the side of the mountain and were actually frightened that the homes would come down, you know, off of the hill. And they were amazed that uh, the homes were built on the side of the hill. And, of course, we chuckled about it because it was home to us. We literally lived right off of the railroad tracks. Uh, the J Bridge was within a few hundred meters of our house. And as kids, we walked on the tracks, and we played on the tracks, and, and we did all of those things because we, we literally, as those people did, literally lived within the confines of the mine in the sense that the trains went around us. The Boston Consolidated was right above us. There was always somebody in the street, children playing mostly, uh, sleigh riding or on a wagon, whatever, whatever the weather is. And we'd stop at everybody's houses. Everybody had something for us to eat, regardless of whether they were relatives or not. And everybody was treated the same. And there was no discrimination. Sophia's parents, Pete and Milka Leverich, came from Yugoslavia. They met and married in Bingham. They did not speak English. When I first went to school, I didn't know a word of English. And I had to learn it. Uh, all I knew was, was six, that I was supposed to tell them I'm six years old. <laughs> That's all I knew, and then finally I picked it up in a hurry. A lot of kids didn't speak it for a long time and they learned each other's language. We weren't divided in religion. They, they had different churches. There was a Swedish church, Catholic church, but we all went to the community house to Miss Duhigg, regardless of what the religion was. Ada Duhigg, a Methodist deaconess, came to Highland Boy in 1932 during the depths of the Depression. She wrote that she had received a call from God to enter missionary work. She entered the canyon on a dark, rainy day in August, unable to see the glorious mountains, not knowing that for the next 28 years that she was going to live in this crack in the earth. I realize what a wonderful part the community house of Highland Boy played in the life of Bingham. Ada Duhigg was the supervisor and was the most community-minded person I have ever contacted, and her heart and soul were dedicated to the interest of all people. Although the house was operated under the direction of the Methodist Church, it was always open to Mormon, Catholic, Jew, and all races, creeds, and denominations. It was always open to community activities, whatever they might be. We held many preschool clinics there, also general health clinics for the whole community. We spent many mornings taking out tonsils and adenoids. Dr. Paul S. Richards. Miss Duhigg, as she was affectionately called, was known as the Angel of Bingham Canyon. No one did more to make Bingham a closely knit community than Miss Duhigg, wrote biographer Flora Lee Millsaps. She served from love and gratitude. All the children at the canyon were her children. She was a big help to me because I always knew where my brothers and sisters were. See, I, I kept track of them all the time and I knew they were down at the community house. 
because she had things for them to do. Uh, there was a lot of young boys that got into trouble, but I mean, she was always there to step in to help them before the police would come. And I'm not gonna mention any names, but there were a lot of boys that their lives were turned around because of her. It was a gathering place for everyone of all ages. And the library had all kinds of books. You know, she had all the funerals for the people that uh, died in mine accidents. Sometimes the other churches would not bury them. They either didn't have loved ones or didn't. She always took them. She ministered to everyone, to everyone. And if you were of mixed marriage and you didn't fit any place else, you fit there. You know what was the beauty of this? She saw the good in everybody. Oh, by the way, and you didn't get a lot uh, away with a lot with Miss Duhigg and Miss May either. I mean, discipline was also an aspect of your going there. And they were not hesitant to discipline kids, such as myself, who would get out of line. You know, so it was, it was a house of joy and a house of hope. It was also a house where you showed respect for other people, which was very important to them. The Reverend Duhigg retired from the community house in 1968. At the time of her death, the report in the Salt Lake Tribune read, she served 28 years in Bingham, becoming like a mother to the Canyon residents. The 1920s were a decade of prosperity and good times in Bingham Canyon. The town of Copperton was started, and the Gemmel Club was built in Carr Fork, and the new high school was completed in 1925. We had the Isis, Gem, and Princess Theaters, the Princess in Highland Boy, and the Diana in Copperfield. Dances were held weekly at Canyon Hall, Dreamland, and the Gemmel Club. The paving of the main street was completed in November of 1928. It was an era when all the moonshine was not over the mountains. A fabulous time in Bingham. We look forward to a bright future, a little knowing the things to come in the next decade. The geography of the canyon left Binghamites vulnerable to many natural disasters, and they learned to live with the threat of many potentially devastating man-made dangers as well runaway trains and horse-drawn wagons and blasting from the ever-present mining operations. But in those early years, they became all too familiar with another threat, fire. The siren went off, and of course, my father jumped out of bed because he was a fireman. He said, come and look. And there on the meat shop, there was a fire right on the corner. I got up and looked out of the window, and I saw the house across the street from the heat of this house next to us, shoot right up in flame. The homes were old and dry, you know, the timber was dry, and they were very close together, and that was dangerous. And it was very hard to keep the fire from spreading. We had to leave our home, and all we had was the clothes on our back. When we looked at our home, there was nothing, nothing left and it took a whole section of Bingham. And uh, our house, the hotel, and all the places up the hill were all burnt down. And uh, the only thing that I remember they saved, I don't know who did it, but somebody pushed a piano out. <laughs> Nothing else. We just had what we had on. You know, not too many people had telephones either to call one another, but they had the mine whistle. And when the mine whistle would blow these uh, long and short whistles, you knew that there was a fire. We've been, I was involved in a few flowers that uh, I, I just can't describe them. There's an example where one little baby was burned to death. Uh, another one was where uh, three homes were on fire, and if we couldn't control them, three homes, the whole block would go. I remember the 1932 fire, and it was frightening. You know, you saw all this smoke. We knew there was a fire, and you could see it, because it was in, during the day. 
I remember being afraid, you know, and my mother sent me to the store, to the grocery store, and I turned around and went home because I was afraid. Now that's the memory that stands out in, in my mind about the 1932 fire, which was the biggest fire, you know, while I was growing up up there. The fire was of great proportions. The school building burned down, and great sections of the district were burned out. Hundreds were left homeless. Dr. Paul S. Richard. But Highland Boy was never the same after this fire. Most of the homes were not replaced, and the hillside that was covered with homes clinging to the steep slopes soon reverted back to nature and was covered with bushes and flowers. As if the little communities and townspeople in the canyon had not endured enough, another kind of natural disaster struck. It was on February 18th of 1926 that the greatest tragedy in the history of Bingham Canyon occurred. 39 lives were snuffed out by tons of snow and other debris that came thundering down Dottie Gulch shortly after 9 o'clock a.m. The winters in Bingham were very severe. As the wind blew up on slope of the mountain, it blew the snow over the crest, creating great cones of overhanging snow on the opposite side. It was then these cones broke off in great massive proportions and created a large moving mass which took everything with it. Trees, rocks, houses, and every other object, large or small. Dr. Paul S. Richard. They buried under so many, and uh, they had something like 200 people digging them out. It just wiped out just a lot of Highland Boy. These girls I went to school with, their mother was killed in it. That was such a tragedy, and the mortuary was filled with corpse, and the hospital was full. My memories of that snow slide was watching them come down with sleighs and taking the bodies out of the sleighs into the mortuary. They were just frozen, and of course there was a lot of people coming down from Highland Boy, I guess, to see if they could recognize some of these people, because a lot of people would have just come from a country to work, and people didn't even know them. And uh, they were buried in the city cemetery in Bingham. And once in a while, you'll see a little marker, snow slide victim. This was the beginning of a series of blows to Highland Boy that included another slide, a disastrous fire, depression, and the closing of the Highland Boy and Apex Mines over the next two decades. In the midst of fighting fires and snow slides, the Great Depression hit the canyon. Residents clung tight to one another. Utah Copper rotated shifts to enable all employees to earn some pay each week. During the Depression, the company would even buy flour and stuff like that and give it to the people that were living there. And, uh, you know, it's always built a good relationship between management and the people who were in management. Uh, they thought more of the people. A ton in the company were pretty good. They, uh, they help one another too, I thought. And I think uh, the town and, uh, and all the people that live there, they, uh, they took care of each other too, you know. It is true that most mining towns were largely made up of different races and creeds. But here we were so compact. We all used the same schools, the same churches. We even used the same street. Of course, we only had one to begin with. You know, nationalities or religion didn't mean a thing to anybody. You were one of the people that lived there. Whether you were uh, anything, you know, it didn't matter to the other people. When the Methodists had their bazaars, everybody came. And when the Swedes had their dance, we'd all go and do the Swedish shoddish and have a ball. And then at Christmas time, up at Highland Boy, they called it Bohunk Christmas. And you were really insulted if you weren't invited. My father was Orthodox, and he had this Serbian Christmas and he'd invite the whole town. Everybody came to our house, and they used to call it the Bohong Christmas. And Dr. Richards was a main guest there. 
and he'd come and stay with my dad all day long. And we'd have everybody that wanted to come there all day long and eat. They'd celebrate for about three days. They'd have all the food that they wanted, and Dad was quite a party giver. To a certain degree, they get along pretty good, but yet there was little discrimination. Discrimination, the fact that you were, were not white and you didn't fit in because you come, your parents weren't from here or something like that. And therefore, some of the jobs that would come up, you wouldn't get them because you weren't in the right spot and you weren't right, the right person. Beings that you were not white. <laughs> and uh, and I, I went through that, and I went through that during some strikes. I, I don't believe that there's any question that there was discrimination in hiring um, in the company. And it isn't as though this was a, it was Pollyanna. Uh, there are stories of the Croatians and the Serbians shooting at one another and killing one another, as an example, in Bingham. I mean, that happened. Um, um, they used pejorative terms with one another. I mean, my father referred to my mother as a Dago. My mother is Italian. My mother referred to my father as a Bohunk, okay? Those kind of words came out. They weren't intended to hurt. And I, and I think people understood where they were coming from because people grew up. But there was prejudice in the sense that I think that people did um, feel as though the company did discriminate against some of the Eastern European people, the Mexican people, certainly. And, um, and I know that my, uh, my grandfather on my mother's side felt that type of discrimination because the first people that were sent down the mountain when tough times came were not the so-called white people. But we all played together, and the Anglo families were just as poor as we were. The older people couldn't talk English. They, uh, and so they stayed amongst themselves. But us kids, we went from camp to camp. We was sneak into Jap camp and go into their hot tubs. Uh, we'd go up to Dinkyville and, and play with the kids. We played our different sports games. We did all kinds of uh, things amongst each other. There were not many flat open places to play in the canyon. Nevertheless, the children of Bingham were imaginative and scrappy. You could get on a sled and start up the top, which was up there where uh, Lee Halverson lived, up in Telegraph. You'd get on that sled and you'd go all the way down to Bingham. And it'd probably be about a mile and a half ride on the sled. <laughs> Nelson Buck Leba remembers getting stitches from Dr. Frazier after one of many sledding accidents. He called the kids in and said, look at his eye. And he'd, and he'd take that needle and he'd pull it and he'd pull it out like that and make me go like that and the kids would look at it and would look at it and they were sort of scared of them and uh, it it's he says you guys should be sleigh riding on the streets he said I don't want to I don't want to see no more of this kind of stuff but we we kept sleigh riding it a more profitable pastime for the children was selling copper ore usually small pieces of galena or iron pyrite to the tourists. You just went around and, and found it all over. It was just all over pieces of ore, and you'd just fill a little cigar box or whatever and, and then just show it. And, and at, while they were waiting for the light to change at the tunnel, we'd all go around all the cars there and, and, and sell it. Galena is a beautiful copper ore, the bread and butter of old reliable, the sustenance of life in the canyon. Galena Days were celebrated in September to honor the old timers. It was a typical mining town celebration. The men had to grow a beard, and I forget when they'd have to start growing that, but all the men had a beard. And if they didn't have a beard, they'd, they'd find them a dollar, you know, and, and uh, everybody had fun. It was on Main Street, just by the tunnel, 
There weren't that many automobiles up there, so they could just use a whole street, and everybody just ran around, and just all the kids, and mothers, and babies, and everybody turned out. And they'd have watermelon contests, pie-eating contests, all the old-fashioned things. And the women, you know, when they had the celebration, they would dress in these old-time dresses, and they gave prizes for the best entry. There was a lot of um, mine uh, drilling, you know, contests, and dance. Then they had a big dance up there, too, after. Well, let's see, the last year was 54 when I was mayor. That was the last year. And uh, we were honoring the copper mine. As the weather warmed, the mountains sprouted green and wildflowers bloomed. The canyon became an outdoor adventure land for a kid. Uh, we called it a swimming hole. All it was was a, a big thing of water, big pond of water that uh, was draining from an underground mine. And all was in there was all this, you could see the copper, you know, the colored water. Well, we didn't have anywhere to swim, so we went sw swimming and wading in that. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> but that was our fun. I remember as a, uh, as a little boy playing in the entrance of Utah Metal Tunnel because it was really cool when it was hot in the summer, and also the family walking through the Utah Metal Tunnel to go picnic over on uh, the Middle Canyon side. We had coca dirt in Telegraph, and everybody came to play in it. What it was was the tailings from an old mill, a concentrator, and it was full of arsenic, lead, and iron, and sulfur. Buck, Nelson Leva would gather all the gangs together for our football and baseball games. Then they would bus us to Copperton to play ball. And we played ball under a guy by the name of Bailey Sam Stephen. And he used to call the league the Eskimo Pie League. Today it's known as the League. Bailey Santa Stephen invented the Eskimo Pie League in the early 1930s and coached baseball and football at Bingham High School until his untimely death at the age of 52 in 1954. There was a lot of us that didn't have our own baseball man. We didn't have our own uh, bat. We didn't have a baseball. A lot of us didn't have that, but as, as a, uh, a group, We'd all share what we had. Each little community in the canyon had a team, even Frogtown, organized from the peewees to the juniors up through the seniors who played American Legion ball. There was fierce pride in the teams that represented the various mines. The day of the game was a three o'clock day at the mines, and many stores closed early. The loyalty to the team went from the top brass to the workmen. Bingham High School baseball victories are the stuff of legend. They first won the state baseball championship in 1932 and have captured the title 17 times since. We had three main grade schools in Bingham, one in the Highland Boy District, one in Bingham proper, and one in Copperfield. The students were transported in wagons and bobsleds until about 1926 or 27 when trucks were used. I visited the Highland Boy School a month or two after my arrival in Bingham and was taken from room to room by the principal. On entering one room, I asked, how many different nationalities do you have in this room? He answered, I don't know how many we have in this room, but at the moment we have 22 different nations represented in the school of 300 pupils. I remember that remark very vividly. Dr. Paul S. Richards. The Bingham School District was organized in 1873. Although many of the immigrants arriving from other countries could not speak English, they were determined that their children learn the language. They wanted them to succeed in America. In 1931, a new high school was constructed in Copperton, the new company town at the mouth of the canyon. Bingham High became the center of not only sports competitions, but cultural events as well. From 1921 to 1939, Miss Louise Van A, after her marriage, Miss Louise Jager, was the school nurse, and her services were invaluable. She was cheerful, understanding, and very efficient. Much credit is due her in carrying out this health program in the schools. My being European by birth helped me to understand some of the worries and insecurities of these mothers who spoke little English. The main emphasis was on sanitation at school and at home. 
The children love to take part in learning to take care of themselves to keep from getting sick. The district established a one-room school for a dozen or so children at the top of the mountain. To my great surprise, I was notified that a horse would be supplied on a once-a-week basis. It was at least a two-mile trip. The canyons above Upper Bingham were beautiful. After her retirement, she wrote, My heart still is with the children who lived up on the mountainside of the mining town, where I had spent the better part of my life. Nurse Louise Van A. By 1939, Bingham was beginning to feel the impact of the war in Europe. With the declaration of a state of emergency by President Roosevelt, the pit increased production in order to aid the Allies. By 1941, Utah copper was working overtime, producing more copper than any other single mine in the world. Bingham was preparing for war. Fathers and sons were drafted or enlisted. It was a sacrifice for all, but even more so for the families who had already lost a breadwinner to the mine. All the friends that I went to high school with were gone before the end of the senior year. They wanted to be in the, in the war effort. During the uh, Second World War, I don't think there was a more patriotic community in the world than Bingham. And people were very anxious to do their best to help the country. And uh, we did write letters. And uh, Chicago Charlie was in charge of a letter that went to the servicemen so that uh, the servicemen had a lot of support from the community. Carl Zahos, a 44-year-old bachelor, better known to Binghamites as Chicago Charlie, formed the canyon's one-man victory flag society. He raised funds for the war effort and sent regular mailings to the servicemen containing news of town happenings, wisecracks, items of scandal, anything a GI would want to hear from back home, according to historian Lynn Bailey. The Spanish-speaking Basque, those from Mexico, the southwestern U.S. and Puerto Ricans, along with the Navajo, helped to fill the labor gap during World War II. In addition, soldiers were furloughed. The women of Bingham and high school boys were hired to work in the mine. Bingham's contribution to the war effort was staggering. From 1941 to 1944, the mine produced over two billion pounds of copper, more than one half of all the copper mined in the U.S. Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941. And then war was declared. Well, I remember when it, the day it happened, it, when the Japanese bombed, because I was working on a track gang, and we had a Japanese track <laughs> foreman. And we knew something happened because he walked way down the track and stayed. He didn't even come back around us. And then later, a little later on, then we found out that what had happened. But uh, there was quite a few Japanese uh, gang bosses not up there. Amy Miyagishima Gonzalez grew up in what was called the Japanese camp area above Copperfield. Her father, Joe, had arrived from Japan when he was in his 20s. Her mother, Tsuyako, was a second generation Japanese from Idaho. Amy later married her high school sweetheart, David Gonzalez. Well, my dad became the camp boss after they established the Japanese camp, and uh, he also ran the boarding house, and our home was just attached to the boarding house. It was a long, corrugated tin home. Uh, we had a Japanese school, and uh, all the Japanese children there went to school once or twice a week. We learned how to write and use the brush uh, penmanship and things like that. Then, of course, after the war happened, it, all that was just forgotten about. I remember I came home from school, and uh, there were, uh, well, a couple strange men in there. And, and uh, my mother just said that uh, my father was going to be going away for a time, but he won't be going very far. And uh, then uh, he was uh, at the Salt Lake County Jail detained there, and every week they had permitted weekly visits. We would all go as family and visit with him. And 
Well, it was lasted about a year, but uh, the town itself, I mean, I can't remember feeling any prejudice or that. In all, 761 men and women from Bingham Canyon served in the war. 15 young men died. The coming of peace made a great change in Bingham. Most of the men returning home were to make new homes for themselves. And so began the exodus from Bingham to the valley. The theme for Bingham Canyon residents during 1962 may well be Old Lang Syne as they face another year of uncertainty. The town is being absorbed by the world's largest open-cut copper mine. Since its discovery, more than four million tons of ore have been mined. The once bustling mining town of 15,000 people at the turn of the century now contains only some 30 families living in the canyon and is slowly dwindling towards extinction. The Salt Lake Tribune, 1962. Right behind our house, so when we used to live on terror sites, there used to be a shovel, <laughs> a big shovel that used to dig right behind our house and load the trains to get all the waste out of the way. And you'd be a bit in bed at night, and all of a sudden you hear that, mm -hmm. <laughs> the noise of the, of the shovel, you know, moving back and forth. And you wonder, gosh, are they going to get us next or what? <laughs> Uh, it was a, uh, it was a little scary to, to know that they were right, right, right behind you, ready to tear your home down. The house we lived in was my mother and father's, and my husband fixed it, really made a nice place out of it. And uh, we knew that we had to move because the ground that the house was on belonged to the uh, Utah Metal Company, and they told us they gave us like a year that we would have to move. And so I went up several times to just look to see what was happening and to see my Aunt Mabel's house vanish, to see the miners' murk, uh, the, the Bingham murk vanish under an avalanche. Um, when they finally got down to the Bingham Hospital where my Aunt Pearl had worked and Dr. Fraser, and that was gone, it was just unbelievable. And I would come away just so sad. Um, because it was a happy time that we just had to say goodbye to. I remember, however, going up there with him and going through the old house with my father and sensing a genuine sadness because what he was leaving and putting behind him, he was also putting the places where I'm sure he could still see his father, his brother Tony and sister Anne who had died when they were children because when they were tearing it down, he was putting that behind him. One of the hardest things I have ever done in my life. In fact, I could hardly see to drive. I was crying so hard. <laughs> oh, it was hard for me to leave because I was raised in Bingham. I was eight years old when I moved to Bingham. And it was really very hard on me to have to leave up there. Well, what I miss is I just missed the whole town. I remember my sister writing to my dad and telling him that no matter where he went, Bingham would always be with him, would be in his heart, and it is. Uh, you could go anywhere in the world, and if someone found out that you were from Bingham, and you says, oh, I'm from Bingham, you would be like lifelong friends. You, would, you could pick up, even if you didn't know that person, just for the fact that you had once lived in Bingham, because it was it was a special place to live. Dear Dad, Much as I want to come home and see you, I am rather glad I won't for a while. To me, I will always be able to see it, it as it was, it was. and, and it, it will always, always be a big, a big part, part of, me. of me. Because I think that everyone who ever lived there and loved it as I did will always have a part of Bingham with him. Don't be discouraged, Pop. You are Bingham. Not the Bingham now forlorn and wrecked, but the Bingham of love and life, of excitement, of Fourth of July parades, of Galena days, of endless friends, young and old. As Colleen so aptly stated, that is the Bingham I shall remember for as long as I live. No matter what, let us have heart and faith. There will always be a Bingham. 
In the hearts and memories of those who loved her, may she be a cherished memory, wherever we may be. John Creed. Local production of Copper Canyon, American Dream, was made possible in part by the R. Harold Burton Foundation, the George S. and Dolores Dore Eccles Foundation, the C. Comstock Clayton Foundation, and the support of the contributing members of KUED.